I always take time to uh, consider the world of the play that I'm writing. Um, when I wrote plays like Black Mountain and The Brink, um, I was really keen uh, to use genre as part of my tools of storytelling. Um, audiences are very story literate. Um, we're born being told stories. Um, often there's even a story about how we were born. Um, and we're told stories um, throughout our lives. Um, we use stories to learn. It's how we explore the world. Um, and so that means that the audiences that come to our plays are expert story decoders. And they're constantly looking for clues or signals um, to indicate um, um, how the story is going to unfold, what's going to happen next. Um, and I love to play with that expectation that an audience will have. And I, and I like to use genre, um, which has its own specific tells and signals, um, um, to manipulate an audience uh, uh, um, um, into expecting certain things. And I like to respond to those expectations as a writer. So world of, of the play is really important to me. Um, when I wrote my play Mumsy, I set it in the present. Um, started writing it in 2017, so it was set in 2017, and it's going to be on in 2023, so it will be set in 2023. Um, I set it in a one-bedroom flat, and I set it in Hull, uh, my hometown. So that really influenced the story in so many ways. Uh, the fact it was in the present meant that I really had to research what are the jobs these characters would be doing, how much would they be earning, where would they realistically be living, um, the one bedroom flat was great um, as a theatrical device because it meant the characters were really on top of each other and any sort of conflicts they were having were really magnified. Um, and then thirdly, setting it in a hole meant hopefully that I could make the story feel authentic. I understood um, the voices of the characters. I could picture who they were in relation to people that I knew. And also I really wanted it to have a really authentic feel in terms of um, real places, um, and real references. So a few years ago, I co-wrote a play called Fudge, which was all about a gay couple in Bristol falling in love and then trying to navigate their relationship, trying to figure out if they wanted to be monogamous or reimagine their relationship. And one of the very first decisions we made was to set it in Bristol because we both lived there at the time. So it felt right for us to set it there because it was part of our own journeys, our own experiences of the world. And what that gave us really, really helpfully was kind of a cheat sheet to the play. We didn't have to spend ages thinking, where does this date happen? Which bar, what's that bar like? Because it's the bar that we'd gone to for three years. So we knew it really, really well. And what that meant was that we didn't have to spend so much time thinking about location and could spend way more time digging into these people and digging into their relationships. The other thing that was really, really helpful and that I would always recommend doing when you're writing a play is put a clock on your action. Set a deadline by which things have to happen. I think as people in the world, unless we have to do something by a certain point, very often we don't do it. So in Fudge, one of the characters had a wedding coming up. So all of the action in the play led up to this wedding. And the nearer that wedding got, the less time these characters had to make decisions, the more likely they were to make that sudden decision that actually they regret, but in the moment it felt like the only thing to do, which meant we could do really dramatic, exciting things with these characters. When I wrote the play The Coppergate Woman, I set the story partly in Viking York, um, which meant there were kind of certain rules in that world that affected how we told the story. Um, one of those was that it was a world without technology one of those was that it was a world which had a different relationship to the ideas of myth and storytelling and how they interacted with a kind of literal reality and one of those was that it was a world in which people had um real kind of lived experiences of death and um grief and violence and would interact with them perhaps more than we do in the modern world. In At the Gates of Gaza, the drama is set during the First World War, 1917, during the Third Battle of Gaza in the Middle East. Number two, the, the Holy Land, the religious geography that surrounded the raging battle, which included Beersheba, the River Jordan, Jerusalem and Gaza itself. Number three, 
the desert and thirst. When I was researching the play, I went to the Imperial War Museum and read diary accounts of the men who fought and the thirst that they experienced during the brutal heat of the desert. When I wrote my play The Second Minute for the Nottingham Playhouse, which was connected to the anniversary of the First World War, in the process of writing it, I'd been to a military archive and had read this big stack of letters from one particular soldier, uh, sent to and from this soldier, who'd lived through the entire war. And then right at the end, in the last months of the war, I discovered in these kind of final letters that, that he'd died. And it really hit me. I was genuinely upset when I read these letters. And I knew then that whatever I did, I had to somehow make sure that the audience felt what I had felt. And I was trying desperately to think, how can I tie together these letters? Because uh, the play was also partly about the postal service and the act of writing letters during the First World War, which was an incredible moment of letter writing um, in our history, in our national history. <clears throat> and this, and this, this death. And I decided to create a ghost story and to bring the archivist into the heart of the story. But that for the soldier to exist, the archivist decided to read these letters one uh, a day. And the reason for that was because we learned that she's also lost a son in a modern war. And so she's holding on to something. And so both she and the soldier that arrives on the stage and she develops a relationship with, who becomes like a surrogate sent to her, um, neither of them know what is going to happen. And yet both, particularly her, kind of fear the worst. And that was all predicated on trying to ensure that when the moment came that we learn of Private Swan's death, when the soldier learns that he's going to die, when she realizes that against all hope, he hasn't survived the whole war, that that moment had the same punch as it had for me. So it was, the, in a way, the research and the impact for me uh, of that research that drove the kind of narrative form and the decision to create a ghost story. <laughs>